Hi, I'm Chip Livingston, and I'm delighted to be here with Linda Hogan and readers and friends of Oklahoma Libraries and the Oklahoma Center for the Book to celebrate Linda Hogan and her most recent Oklahoma Book Award for A History of Kindness, 2021's collection of poems published by Tory House Press. It's a real honor for me to speak with Linda, a mentor and a friend for more than 25 years, my favorite writer of all time, an author I teach with every semester, regardless of what genre I'm teaching, since she's so prolific in not just poetry, but also fiction and nonfiction. I admire Linda in so many ways, but in introducing myself and part of this conversation today, I wanted to share a little of my personal history of the kind of kindness Linda has shared with me as a mentor and as a writer and as a sister on this beautiful planet we share. I first met Linda Hogan in 1996 when I moved from Florida to study in the University of Colorado's Masters in Fictions program. Linda was the reason I applied to that university. As I already knew before meeting her that she was who I most wanted to learn from. But when I arrived in the fall of 1996, Linda was on a sabbatical year away from the university. Regardless of that, a couple of weeks after the semester began, Linda called me on the phone to check on how I was settling into the program. I said it was great, but I was only disappointed that I couldn't study with her that year. She said, why can't you? And I said, because you're on sabbatical, you're not teaching. And Linda said, come to my house next week and bring me, bring me new work to read. I was shocked. Anyone who knows the, demand, the demands on time that teaching requires knows how sacred time off to actually write is. And yet Linda invited me to a private, free of charge, creative writing workshop in her home. Um, and we studied together that whole year. Sorry, I've got a dog barking. Um, it's okay, I'll have a cat. <laughs> um, anyway, Linda and I had a private tutorial in her home that entire year. And I remember the very first time that I visited her in her house and how at home she made me feel, serving me tea and asking me about myself, my family, my writing. And then she took me for a walk over the mountain naming native plants, distinguishing paw prints of a nearby mountain lion from a bobcat, pointing out deer prints, and telling me stories and natural histories of the flora and fauna she shared the mountain with. That was 25 years ago, and yet as I read this newest collection of Linda's poetry, A History of Kindness, I felt like Linda was still walking with me among her land and histories pointing out the life all around us, showing all of us the living things and how we are connected and sharing that same generosity of her time and herself and her knowledge with readers around the world. So thank you, Linda, for that very first walk, all the walks in the mountains and deserts we've shared since then, and for these histories of not just your own paths, but the walks and flights and swims of all living creatures we share and have shared the earth with. So, Mado, gracias. Thank you, Chief. Chip, thank you. Um, so I have a few questions for you and some of my okay. own thoughts about this recent publication. First of all, I find A History of Kindness to be such a generous book, generous in its breadth and its span, composed of five interior books, um, covering memorial time to the present year, and a book that even goes deeper than your previous collections into the consciousness and the subconsciousness, our memory, the human body, and how it adapts to change, how the earth and all living creatures, even mountains and waterways and prairies, adapt and change. And I hoped you might talk a little bit about this collection of poems and how that title, a history of kindness speaks to that generous empathy you impart to our histories. That's a complicated question. I'd like to take it apart a little bit. Um, I think, let me just say one thing before I answer it. 
today I was thinking my first waking thought was that I'm not living just a day. I'm not living just a time and place, but that life, our life is a journey all the way through, a spiritual journey. And that my cat's now visiting. And that we need to, that with my work, I think what I do is recognize um, that Part of that journey is understanding the context in which we all live and that the lives around us, whether they be human, whether they be animal, whether they be tree or cat or dog, that all of them are a part of our lives and that our soul doesn't live just within our bodies or we don't know where it lives. If we tried to locate it, it's definitely not the mind. It's not even really the heart, even though it feels that way so much of the time. Much of it is outside of ourselves because we live in just this context. And I think the book addresses that. And it also addresses the awareness and the watchfulness and the awe of what another human being is our relationship with everything, our, my relatedness to observing what the animal behavior is. I'm fortunate enough to live in a place where I can hear the deer talking outside my window. And yes, they, the mothers talk to the young and then they have a sound they make when there's a threat and they leave all at the same time. And I can observe the life of the crows. I observe the lives of all the things around me. But I also observe humans and try to understand human nature, which is the most difficult because we haven't really found our place yet in this world. And I think with my writing, each book, each project I do is a step toward placing us. And I don't know if that is even close to the answering your question, but in a way, it all has to do with kindness. It's not that I need to jump, jump to any quick conclusions about anything or live. I recently had an experience with somebody else's anger and I began to wonder what is anger? I suppose mostly it begins with hurt or defense of ourselves in some way. But in this world, as long as humans have lived here, I am tired of war. I am tired of the anger. I am tired of all the things that people are and that they do not have to be. That um, is a great answer, and it actually is a great transition into another question I had for you, um, which is about you know the same thing, I think. In your poem in the book titled Embodied, you write, once I was told you become what you think, so I think the gone animal's back. And you name what has fallen from this life as, quote, whole. And to me, that illustrates the kind of intentional balance I always find in your words, a kindness or a healing um, and the, pro the processes of healing to sort of counter the unkind human stories we so often witness. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, how conscious are you when you're writing or when you're publishing of that intentional balancing? You know, I don't think very much when I write. My writing comes from some other place and I don't know where. And so I don't know if it's intentional or not. I mean, I selected the title, but it was based on the title poem. And so I um, think that with what I do when I write is I just, go somewhere that's magical and 
the words don't just come always, but sometimes they do. Then I have to go back and look at the drafts and see what the poem is trying to say to me. It's my teacher. I don't know things. I don't know. We were talking about craft, you know, like I noticed other writers too. They don't know how to give a craft talk because they don't write from craft. They don't think about what they're doing until the very last steps. And so this morning early, I was looking at some new work and I thought, oh, you know, these are so horrible, but what are they trying to do? And then I will go through and mark some places I think that are they're trying to go and see where those are. And then maybe add to them, maybe subtract a lot. Most of them have a lot of subtraction. It's a mathematical process, I guess, <laughs> in that way. But um, it's work, but it's also something that's almost mystical. When I first discovered writing, I was an adult. I wasn't in school. I wasn't young. I didn't want to be a writer. I worked with handicapped kids that had cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, all kinds of physical problems. And I loved my students and I loved my job. And then someone sent an anthology of contemporary poetry and it was the first time I'd ever seen it. And so, you know, I was in my mid twenties by then. And, um, you know, I thought I was gonna be doing other things in my life. And then I went back to school. I asked someone if I could sit in on their writing workshop. And by the end of that workshop, I already had my first book ready for publication because I was, old, and it was because I was older, an older student. So I had a lot of experience behind me. And I also had my early life, which was quite unusual in America now to write about. And so um, I was ahead. I started ahead because of my age. And ever since then, I've still felt every, I love my work. I still feel that magic and that excitement of writing that I don't always know where it's going to take me. And that's what I really love. It is, like I said, my leader, my teacher, my mentor. And I don't, I am not in control. I'm not the boss here. <laughs> I like to think that I was, but I'm not. I and fortunately, I can't boss anything. Even my files, I've been trying to put in order. Um, that's always a challenge, the organization. Um, I, I appreciate so much the way you answered that question. You know, I ask about your intention and you, you know, turned it around to the intention of the poem. And I think that's beautiful. And I think it illustrates, you know, the gift of your words to us. You also mentioned that title poem, um, A History of Kindness in which you end um, that verse with the question, what else would a real human do? And um, I feel like your writing is so often an instruction on how to be human or how to be a better human, even the 2008 poetry collection, Rounding the Human Corners. You were finding our place and what, you know, even, you know, then you were, you were searching for what is the human place? I suspect you've always been that generous and mindful, a caregiver of the world around you. Um, but how do you stay in love with the world? How do you stay, you mentioned staying in love with the work. Um, how do you stay in love with the world? Oh, all I have to do is see a tree. I have to go outside and know that it's also a living being. And sometimes I say hello to the trees and I feel like maybe in imagination or maybe in reality, in some way they respond and I feel it. Or, you know, I can't say that all of my meetings with 
wildlife have been happy ones. I've been in situations that they are dangerous between three bears one time trying to get what I thought was the mother bear out of a tree where my horses were. And it turned out she was the yearling. The mother was up the hill from me. The baby was on the other side. And suddenly I heard this horrible sounding growl from my left and it was the mother protecting her littlest one from me who was in the middle. And I thought, I'm really in trouble. <laughs> and I had to get my flashlight, shine it towards the mother bear um, and back up slowly into my house. But I could have been in another situation where I wouldn't have had my house. Um, I'm, I appreciate that. I appreciate those stories too, you know, that you share. Um, I remember, you know, when you were also in between a horse and a mountain lion, um, when that caused your um, fall from the horse. You spoke about, you know, just needing to go out and see a tree to be reminded of that love that you have for the earth. And another poem in the collection titled Lost in the Milky Way, you write, quote, some of us are like trees that grow with a spiral grain as if already prepared for the path of the spirit's journey, end quote. And I read in another interview in which you described this book as a tree um, from seedlings to roots and the rings that represent the years of growth. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that as the book of the book as a tree itself. And the undergrowth of it, um, you know, the roots of it that go for so long and so communicate with each other, with other trees. But um, the Lost in the Milky Way was actually a longer piece and it's based on Chickasaw astronomy. And I've done so much research on sideways on Chickasaw history, astronomy, um, our planting methods and how we took care of forests. But we were river people and we were also forest people. And it was commented on by Cortez when he first arrived there in 1500s. And, you know, his journals are full of comments on how incredibly amazing it was. And we already knew he was coming and we knew what kind of person he was. So we moved away to another village and let him and his men live in where we were had been living. But that's a, another story. Anyway, I just did a lot of research and um, part of it was I was really interested in astronomy from different tribes. And I started with that interest by finding a Skiddy Pawnee um, star chart that was on leather and it had the Milky Way, I believe as a herd of antelope going up into the sky. And I started thinking every tribe had its astronomy and the Southeast tribes had similar astronomies, but different stories. So we had the Big Dipper was actually a canoe. So was the Little Dipper. And so it was a completely different world that we lived in. We based the sky and the earth on the same events, the same thing. So what you have on the earth, you really have in the sky also. So like if you have, you know, a turtle on earth, that becomes the sky. And the Greeks had these insane gods that messed around with humans and ruined their lives. And that became the predominant astronomy most people live by. So I, took that lost in the Milky Way as our journey to the soul world. Thank and you that's, for that. That's Thank the you. spiral in the tree too, which is like the yeah. spiral of the Milky Way. 
Our right. astronomers had the primary. Some people think we had kings because Europe had kings. We didn't have kings here. That was a word that came from Europe. And so the actual people who had the most significance were the astronomers and they lived at the top of the pyramids like at Cahokia. So the places at the top of the pyramids were for the sky watchers. But most people think they were for the kings and that everybody else was sort of a serf and a slave. But serfs come again from kings and serfs come from Europe at that time. That, I'm that, sorry, that, I'm getting carried away here with history. No, but you're answering a question that I actually was also going to ask about that poem, Lost in the Milky Way, and your interest in your research on native science and native cosmology. Um, because I was going to ask you about, you know, what drives you to uncover and remember and preserve and share that knowledge. But I think you just answered that question as a counter to the dominant cultures or stories that, you know, have been imposed upon the whole world. Um, and the entire also. world, the whole world has been colonized. <laughs> yeah, and that's, the thing is that the rest is not lost, but it's hard to find. And one of the things that I think is interesting is that Maori people, a lot of the tribes in California, they're all recovering their old knowledge and living in a different way now. Hi, sweetheart. Here's little guy. He's not exactly little. He's bigger than I am. Um, he, every, you know, the, the whole world would be different had we not paid attention to those who forced us to be like Americans, wanted us to be like Americans. And yet we're not like Americans inside. We just live in this place where, that we call that country. And yet it's just a country around other countries. We have our own countries and they're sovereign nations. We live in countries within another. Yes. I think I got waylaid by the cat and forgot what I was saying, but it had to do with the world being colonized and some people bringing back their traditions really well, and then some people not doing it. And I think for some it's harder, and especially with Christianity, uh, boarding schools, a lot of people were forced into belief systems that are not the original ones. And um, some things about it are maybe good and other things about it are not appropriate for us as native peoples. Um, thank you. Thank you for the information you continue to share, um, not just in your written words, but in your spoken words and just your, your walk on the earth. It means so much to me and you do. Um, I think I'm gonna you know, end the questions actually, so we have time to hear a couple of your poems. Um, I wanna thank you and thank the Oklahoma Center of the Book for letting me participate in this conversation in this honoring of you and your award-winning book of poems, A History of Pot Kindness. Um, but I hope we might end the conversation by you honoring us by sharing a poem or two. I wanted to read the title poem and because I was on the wrong time frame, here it is. Um, I have a three. Do we have time for that or not? Yeah. I'll just do two. Okay. <laughs> a history of kindness. When a child becomes an animal in clouds, changing forms to other creatures, our grief has become a kindness to the sky. 
When the hay is baled and you worry, what if a mouse or a snake is inside? That is a gentleness. When the horses are fed and all that's left is a withered apple for a woman to eat, and she is grateful for the life of all things, and so she feeds it to the horse, that is a good heart. When you are gentle to the skin of others, touching them softly, speaking with gentle words, it is compassion. When there is agreement among those who might have argued instead, it is a gift to all. When skin is the first organ to form inside the body of a mother, and skin is the largest organ we have, that is a mother's first protection. If you still love the invisible place where a child once stood, the heart recalling her soft hair, her long dark legs, that is the spaciousness of memory. And when you pick up the old woman from the worn road to help her home, and you see that inside she has nothing, you give her the food you have. You give the only can of coffee, then start her wood stove and leave your coat behind on purpose. What else would a real human do? The current veins of history are open as words and borders, worlds and borders define themselves. We wish for some new seed of vision as the world may grow if only for a moment silent, wordless and fresh as a bare room with windows open. Friend, even the many I will never know, none of us alike, we are only in the same rushing current of life, each with our one-celled beginnings, still merely primordial life opening to step out toward the years of life, we hope with stories of those who birthed us, flowing with love or childhoods of hurt from being human and for a time, it all seemed fine. In this moment of stopping, in that room safe with curtains billowing, for just this moment, can't we touch one another gently and ask about our lives? Even the earth knows these veins that run like rivers of sweet water into countries, great one day, gone the next, or flowing into one another to create something new. As we are silent in this moment, be a friend, no weapon, not even arrows of words, just easy human waters together. Be like the animal that opens hardness and carries inside a pearl or a goddess that steps out to a new human accord. Thank you, everybody, Chip. Thank you, especially, and thank you for, to all the judges and to everyone, Kathy and Connie and everyone that made this possible. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Linda, and congratulations. Thank you.